be even uh, uh, easier than uh, Pascal's. I mean, uh, in the sense that uh, I'm going to do at least one of the exercises Pascal proposed about computing the genus of that L shaped surface. <laughs> um, anyhow, uh, I think that uh, uh, these objects uh, that I'm going, we are going to discuss today, they are a good point of entry to this subject called Tashimu Dynamics because they are uh, sufficiently elementary so that you can put your hands. That will be the goal of this mini course. And uh, you can put your hands in many abstract concepts that come out in this Tashimu Dynamics theory. So let's see. Um, yeah, so Pascal already gave the definition of uh, square surface, but let me give uh, uh, many definitions. So definition one is a, a collection, a finite collection, sorry. Finite collection of unit squares in R2. <coughs> Uh, whose sides are glued by translations. Well, I'm writing this definition as uh, an informal definition. I mean, uh, actually, if you want to give a, usually, if you want to give a formal definition of translation surface, it might take you uh, 50 minutes. So if you want a proof of that, you can check on YouTube the uh, Bourbaki lecture of Jean-Francois Kahn. So he spends a lot of time just to define correctly in a Bourbaki way translation surface. So I'm not going to do that. But uh, I'm going to at least give more hints of what I mean by gluing, by translation. So one thing is that I want to glue um, <coughs> in a picture like that. So let's take three squares. I want to glue uh, right sides with left sides and bottom sides with top sides. So say I, I want I this is the right side of a square, so I want to glue eventually with some left side, uh, top side with a bottom side, but I want to avoid having to glue a right side with another right side. Why? Because this means that around this point, <coughs> if I do this identification by translation on right sides, I don't quite get a full Euclidean neighbor around this point, and I, I really want to get to stick to surfaces. So you really, at each point, you have a full topological disk around it, so not these kinds of half disks. So this is forbidden. <coughs> so when I say glue, gluing by translations, is, I mean, it's simply that I, I'm only allowing this kind of gluings. Um, and so forth. <clears throat> okay, so this is one uh, remark. Uh, another definition, so which was also mentioned by Pascal, is that uh, so these are square surfa surfaces, or to, to, to be short, we sometimes call them origamis. <clears throat> I mean, this is, uh, I'm going to write all the time origamis because it's shorter than square type surface, and uh, it will mean the same thing. I think that my, my German colleagues prefer origamis and that the American ones prefer square surfaces. But it's, uh, well, it would be the same for us. Uh, anyway, so uh, an origami, it's a, a couple, uh, x and omega, where x is a Riemann surface. And in my case, since I want to be square tile, uh, my omega is in yellowmorph uh, one form, a bit in differential, like in the case of Pascal. But harder, uh, this omega comes as the pullback of dz under some map on the flat torus. And uh, dz is the, the, the usual form there. OK? So I'm not picking any allomorphic uh, abelian differential. So. But I'm taking these special guys, which are pullbacks from the torus, being differential, which is another name for allomorphic form. <coughs> okay, so this is another definition, and the remark here is that these definitions are equivalent. Uh, pi is part of the definition, right? 
really yes, yes. When I, I write x, I mean, I'm assuming that my x is already a Riemann surface presented in that way. I mean, it's a Riemann surface coming from a cover which is branched, so finite cover, uh, branched only at the origin, zero. <coughs> okay. Sorry, yes, I'll try to, to yeah, I, I know that I have the tendency to write very small characters. I'm sorry. Okay, so these definitions are equivalent. Why? So let me, um, these definitions are equivalent. <coughs> harder. Okay, ah, okay, harder. Okay. Well, that, okay. <laughs> uh, so in one direction, uh, we see that, of course, Uh, I'm just putting the key words is that translations are holomorphic maps. <coughs> and dz is translation invariant. Right? So if I have a bunch of squares in the plane, well, you are doing identification by translation. So the, the quotient of dz is well defined because dz is invariant by translations. And uh, if you look at this structure, you get a Riemann surface with this projection to the torus, which is the basic example. <coughs> and of course, I mean, by definition, the form that you are looking at is precisely the pullback under this projection of the z. So no problem. And uh, on the contrary, what you should do um, is to consider uh, these squares are <coughs> I'm taking open squares so they are the interior of the fundamental domain so I'm taking this open uh, part here I mean it, it, it's open so it's uh, and then I'm taking this uh, pre image to the surface so I'm tidy the surface by squares when I do that. And uh, you can check that uh, since I'm, uh, uh, my form is dz, actually I'm gluing <coughs> these squares by translations. I mean, I, I left this as an exercise. But the good point about this remark is that this, uh, these objects uh, are uh, pr potentially interesting because they have already two definitions which are not so uh, uh, obviously related. I mean, uh, we had a little discussion here. And so in mathematics, I mean, when objects have uh, many different definitions, it's a good sign that uh, it's a healthy uh, object in a broad theory. So let's see. <coughs> Another definition is the following. Uh, it's a pair, uh, an origami is a pair of permutations. H, V of symmetric N, symmetric N, acting uh, transitively, transitively on one N. So this definition uh, is not obvious that it's equivalent, but of course, a remark, it's equivalent to the previous ones. So why? So how do you see the square surface out of two permutations? Uh, simply, you take, uh, these are the labels for the squares. So you take n unit squares. <coughs> and now, uh, sorry, you use the permutations to build a roadmap for the surface. So h is a permutation which, by definition, is going to say who is the neighbor to the right. And I'm gluing this side with this side. And V is the neighbor to on the top. And why I'm asking to act transitively is just because I want connected surface. So both are Yeah, yeah, exactly. Both are yeah, are permutations of sim n. So this is the symmetric group on n big n elements. So both act on one to n by permutations. 
Uh, I'm putting transitively because my surfaces are usually connected. Um, so I want to avoid this kind of example that Pascal was mentioning of uh, uh, Brazil and France. <laughs> Uh, is the same kind of reduce, re irreducibility uh, condition, I mean, uh, basically the theory. And so uh, I think that this, this shows uh, this direction here. And of course, to get the other direction, you just have to label the squares. One, two, three. And the permutation that you get is uh, one goes to two, two goes to one. So it's a cycle. 3 goes to 3, so this is the horizontal. And vertically, 1 goes to 3, and 2 goes to 2. Right? <coughs> of course, we don't want to take, uh, we are interested in surfaces and translation surface, not in numberings. So there is a little uh, point that you should pay attention that when you use permutations to represent surfaces, you take them, so H, V, you should take modulo. Simultaneous conjugations. Conjugations. Right? So this means that HV for me will be the same thing as phi H phi inverse, phi V phi inverse. Uh, why? Because phi, if you do that, is just changing the labelings. So, yes? So again, the, the condition is that the group uh, generated by HV acts transitively. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And so, uh, why um, I'm taking the modulo conjugacy? Uh, we can see in this example here. So, um, yeah. So, of, of course, I mean, I, I, I in this example, I label the the squares like that. But of course, I can label them. Uh, I don't know, one, three, two. And of course, I get another permutation, but I'm not changing the surface. And so, I mean, uh, to, to avoid this distinction between, uh, I mean, I'm not interested in permutations, but in surfaces. So my permutations, my pair of permutations, I always modulo. Um, yeah, so this is what uh, I have to say about the uh, um, definitions. Uh, of course, uh, I told you that, uh, of course, uh, origamis are particular cases, particular examples of translation surfaces. So basically, what you have to do is you change this finite collection of squares by finite collection of polygons, and you glue sets by translations, avoiding this problem of uh, uh, making sure that when you glue, you see a full Euclidean on the side. <coughs> Otherwise, you get half translation surfaces, and I don't want to talk about them. OK, um, so this is very nice. We have particular examples of more complicated objects. Um, and this particular. Uh, Objects are going to be um, uh, very useful to understand the uh, dynamics. So my, my goal is to try to give a glimpse of uh, what, what Tashima dynamic is from the point of view of square surface. So another thing that I want to, to introduce, Pascal mentioned that, but uh, let me put a definition. So when I give a translation surface, I'm calling the translation atlas. or translation shards are going to be uh, the following. You, you have your flat surface. And then uh, outside uh, a singular point, so you fix, you, you fix a, a base point in your, which will be the, the center of the chart. Now you take a small neighborhood of this guy. And you are going to attach a complex number to this point by integration. So z goes to the integral from any path in this small neighborhood um, from p to z omega. So you use the form to integrate. And this gives you uh, 
a chart because this is a complex number. And this chart has a property that uh, change of coordinates are given by translations. Simply because when we integrate from a different point, you are just adding a constant which is uh, the difference between centers. Okay. So in these charts, from the surface to the complex plane, the change of coordinates is given by a translation by a fixed complex number. And so this is why they are called translation charts. Uh, I'm going to make reference to them uh, to define some objects. <coughs> but uh, if you want, it's just the, the coordinates that you see in the squares. This is a fancy name for that. <coughs> OK, so um, examples. So why uh, this definition is interesting? So why this third definition is very interesting is because it gives you a huge amount of uh, a huge supply of examples of uh, square tile surface. So examples, example, um, I'm going to call these examples regular origamis. And so basically, you can construct origamis by giving yourself any finite group. Uh, generated by two elements, generated by H and V. So there are plenty of them. Um, say uh, the quaternion group Uh, you are, but if you take uh, the singular point, then you have a, a more complicated chart. It, it covers uh, finitely many times the disk minus uh, the origin. Yeah, so it's translation outside zeros. Yeah, you are absolutely right. At the zeros, what happens is a little bit different. You get some uh, cover. <coughs> yeah, so I, I'm putting that on the, the carpet. <laughs> Yeah, but if you look at the interior of the squares, I mean, there is no singularity, then uh, this is exactly the picture that you get. You are just translating like that. OK, so uh, I was given, so this is the quaternion group. Quaternion group. So i, j, k satisfy the usual rela relation. I mean, and then you cyclically per plus cyclic permutation of this relation. Um, yeah, of course, you can take uh, the symmetric group uh, with, say, a transposition and a full cycle. Um, you can take SL2 FP and, uh, say, two parabolic matrices. Those generate SL2. So maybe I, I'm going to show that at some point. In this course, yes. Uh, no, no. I'm just giving examples of uh, uh, finite groups which are generated by two elements. I mean, there are plenty. So I'm just giving uh, families, and uh, out of that, I'm going to construct examples. So the examples are just you take each one square for each element of G, and then you glue on the right by multiplying by G on the right. Uh, and then you multiply by v to go to the top, multiply by on the right. I'm multiplying on the right because later I'm going to talk about automorphisms, and I want my automorphism to act on the left. And uh, it's a matter of choice. I mean, uh, there is a beautiful uh, phrase by Sullivan which says that uh, I, wa I want to get automorphism because of some commutativity property, and associativity, uh, commutativity in second order. <laughs> left and right is right left. OK. Um, cool. Um, so this is the family of examples of regular origamis. Actually, this construction for this particular group has a, a name in the literature. It's called the Eierlangen Volmigsau. So my German friends can confirm that uh, this is the name for uh, <coughs> a mythical beast that gives uh, all dairy products uh, milk. And uh, eggs and uh, yeah, so so this is uh, yes. If you take the quaternion groups and the uh, multiplications by i and j, so this gives a uh, eight square 
a surface tiled by eight squares, uh, which is quite special in the theory because it serves a, as contrary examples for many, many things in the theory. And so this is why it's called Eilegan von Migzal because it has many weird properties in, in a single example. <coughs> well, it has a name, so it, it has some reason to have a name. And objects which have names are usually special. I mean, uh, okay, so um, now I can talk about uh, conical singularity. So I'm, I'm going in the direction of solving the exercise by Pascal. Um, so, yeah? Yes. Uh, how do two elements generate the, the four, the, 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 that one, i, j, k? Uh, i and j generate, right? Oh, oh, yeah, sure. Okay. Okay, thank you. Yeah, the generators are i and, uh, yeah. Sure. By uh, i and j. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, conical singularities. So this is what Pascal was talking about when he said that uh, you should, uh, I mean, this, this uh, we are trying to draw higher gene surfaces with flat pictures. So uh, there's a, there's the curvature should be hidden somewhere. Um, and so the example Pascal was giving is that actually uh, for this L surface with these identifications, you can see that this point here, uh, it gets identified along the surface. And the total angle, if you measure, is uh, 6 pi. So it's... Uh, it's a special point, so it's, it's kind of a cone, but not the, the, the usual cone that you think about where the angle is smaller than. It's a, yeah. So it's a, a weird cone where the, the, the angle has, a, well, total angle is six pi around this point. And let's see why this point is really identified. So let's follow the identifications. So we start here, and you start turning around. So you turn around, you come here, and then you come here. Then by identification, you come here, then you go there, then you go here, there, 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 and you're back. So when you turn around this point, you really go all over the corners until you come back. So in, in two pi, you're not back yet. And so this point is very special, so it's why we call it a singularity. It's a special, and it's conical because it's, uh, the angles are always, you can check that it's always, they are always multiples of 2 pi. <coughs> okay, so, um, actually conical singularities uh, encode a lot of the geometry of the surface. Um, so let me give you another example, uh, which is easier, and it's related to another example that Pascal was giving. So you take this big torus, and you make a little uh, surgery, and we identify sides like that, so the middle sides like that. So of course you can do that out of squares. I mean, uh, I, yeah, my, my proportions are not very nice, but uh, you can imagine that uh, this is, can be square tiled. And if you do this, the, the, this picture, actually you see that it has genus two more easily because you get a torus with something like that in the surface, right? Just by doing the outer identifications. And now this thing here it, it adds one more uh, handle. Yeah, my handles are not in yeah, the you see it. We can just, okay. And uh, this point here, actually, if you turn around, it gets identified all over again. I mean, from here, you got there, and there, and there, and back. So it's 3 pi over 2, 4 times, 6 pi. <coughs> and it's really genus 2. Now you see the picture by gluing. But of course, it's not always obvious how to do this uh, topological gluing. For instance, here it's kind of a mess. But actually, there are methods to uh, know the genus without having to do silly uh, gluings and uh, wasting time in trying to do gluing. So um, the the point of the point of the point of view uh, of combinatorial is the following. So combinatorially, combinatorially, um, conical singularities are detected by commutators. So what I mean by that is the following: you take your perfect square. Let's look at the left. 
bottom uh, point here. And let's try to make a, a turn of 2 pi around this point. So if you do that, I'm turning this way first. So this is i h inverse n, the square that I land. Then v inverse h inverse n. Then h v inverse h inverse n. And then I land in some square, which might not be this one. But it's the square uh, v h v inverse h inverse n. So making one turn means applying the commutator of h and v to n. And in particular, if you uh, look at the cycles of the commutators, you can figure out how much angle you have around the point. So example, in this surface, let's see that the total angle around this guy is 6 pi from combinatorics. So the permutations are 1, 2, 3, uh, 1, 3, 2. So the commutator is, uh, let's see, uh, h inverse. So I start with 1. So 1 goes to 2, 2 goes to 2, uh, 2 goes to 1, 1 goes to 3. Uh, 3 goes to 3, inverse uh, to 1, to 2, 2. And uh, well, it's already all squares, but uh, you can check for 2. <laughs> 2 to goes to 1, uh, 1 goes to 3, uh, 3 goes to 3, and uh, 3 goes to 1. So it's closed. So it's a 3 cycle. And so out of that, you can see that how many 2 pi's you did. You did 2 pi 1, 2, 3 times. So 6 pi. <coughs> so commutators I'll give you the conical singularities. And so um, <coughs> let me advance. So I'm, I'm going to hide this thing uh, behind the scene. So I think I can put up right this thing. So, yeah. H is uh, so w which one? H is, is, what H, H is one, two, three. So. So it's just one, two, right? It's yeah. just the permutation one. Yeah, exactly. Permutation one, two, and three is a fixed. This is, uh, I'm representing permutations in, in cycle notation, yeah. Yeah, so I'm sorry, but uh, <laughs> I need some space. Um, I, if I said something wrong, I'm <laughs> hiding it right now. Okay, so let's see. Um, I told you about commutators, so. Uh, Exactly, that, that's what I'm going to write. Uh, yeah, so you, you got my, my phrase, yeah. This is what I was about to write. The total si the total length of size, so what I'm saying that, uh, uh, yeah, so let me put it in English. Uh, Non-trivial cycles of HV uh, correspond to total angles uh, around conical singularities. And the relation is that the total angle is 2 pi times the uh, size of cycle. That, that's what precisely what you just said. <coughs> OK, so, um, so how do you compute, compute the genus out of this uh, thing, as I promised? Oh, I'm slowly solving Pascal's exercise. So the genus you get, uh, say, by triangulation. You can, I mean, the surface is made of, out of square. So you, you put some triangles, and then you just have to do euler poincare So by, by euler poincare <coughs> I'm not going to check, but you can check that uh, uh, if the total angles are 2 pi times k n plus 1. So if there are several conical singularities and these are the partners, then 2 g minus 2, so the Euler characteristic, is just the sum of k n's. <coughs> this is just uh, doing the triangulation and 
observing that around certain points you have more angles, you have more frames, which are attached to this vertex. So in the, in the vertex minus faces plus, yeah, you get my point. So I'm not going to detail this thing. I have more things to say, so. Yeah, so this is the uh, relation. And actually there is a, uh, and so the fact that um, <coughs> the singularities determine so much about the geometry, in particular the genus, uh, motivated people to put together surfaces with the same conical singularity partner. So definition, um, we say that all origami belongs to H K1 K sigma if total angles are 2 pi times Kn plus 1. So you, you are putting in the same space somehow uh, all surface all origamis with a certain uh, combinatorial partner combinatorial pattern for the angles. And why combinatorial? Because I mean, uh, these angles are related to the commutator. So this uh, color, I like to call them combinatorial. Uh, these objects have a name. So actually, this nomenclature here, P mark, <coughs> is that H, K1, Kn is what people call a stratum. So a stratum usually reminds you of the word stratification of a space, which is a decomposition of a certain space into manifolds of varying dimensions. So this is, this is a stratum of what? Of moduli spaces. So now come the big words. Moduli spaces of translation surfaces. I'm not going to enter into too much into that. But the idea is that uh, these origamis are part of a, a big family. So you can deform them to make a non square surface, but it's still translation surfaces with the same partner. And this moduli space is, the, is this family of translation surfaces with these angles. And uh, when you, we use the word moduli, moduli means that we take uh, objects to be the same. So objects are the same if we can go from one to the other by <coughs> cutting and pasting by translations. So in other words, this surface here, the flat torus, and this surface here, when I put, when I apply the matrix 1, 1, 0, 1 to this little square. These are the same in moduli space because I can cut this side, then take out this little triangle, apply a translation to put it here. So you put it here. And then this side comes to here. And the final picture is simply the previous one, except that the blue side, now it's the, it's the vertical. But in moduli spaces, these things are the same. Because you can cut and paste by translation. You should always keep this in mind. You are only allowed to, yeah. Sorry, when you write H, uh, is that K1 to kappa 1 to kappa sigma? sigma? Yeah. So kappa n is defined to be the sum of them, or? Uh, no, no, kappa n is just one of them. It's just an arbitrary element, I mean. What I'm saying here is that uh, total angles are these and varying from one to sigma. Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. Okay, so, um, so yeah, so these are the model space. So, so these are the difficult objects behind the stationary dynamics theory that I was mentioning. They are the phase space of where the dynamics take place. And so as I, I promised, uh, origams are part of this huge world. But as I'm going to see later in lectures, uh, <coughs> They live in a tiny piece, uh, in a tiny piece of this huge world. I mean, the, the SL2R orbit is very small. Whatever this means, we are going to see precisely what I mean by that. But the idea is that these origams are easier to understand, precisely because of, even though they live in a big space, big moduli space, 
what matters for understanding many questions is just a, a small piece of this thing, which is the SL2R orbit. But uh, let's take our time to have fun with origami, so I'm not going to make more uh, comments on this. Other than that, I prefer to, yeah, so give an example, of course. Example. The L belongs to H2. <coughs> the total angle is 6 pi, so you should divide by 2 pi, get 3, and then take out 1. <coughs> OK, so this is the example. And proposition. Proposition. Uh, an origami in H k1 k sigma is styled by at least uh, sum of kn's plus sigma squares. So once you fix the combinatorial partner, I mean, what I mean is that you, can't, you, can't, you cannot build a square tile surface in H2 with less than three squares. <coughs> and this is easy because the commutator moves this number of squares. Right? Because the size of cycles of non-trivial cycles of the commutator are precisely this uh, kn plus 1. And so I'm summing kn's, but since I have 1, and in total I have sigma, so plus sigma. All right? So. <coughs> and you get exactly this number if every corner is a singularity. Exactly. Yeah. OK, so this is a, a, is a uh, proposition just to message our ego. So we can, it's easy to accumulate easy propositions. Yeah? What about the number of squares? Mm -hmm. No, no, origamis have any number of squares. I mean, it, it's a finite collection, but uh, so what I'm saying that. Ah, uh, yeah, that, that, that's a good point. I mean, actually, uh, I, I myself am going to do this. Uh, <laughs> Uh, this uh, a lot, I mean, uh, uh, not respecting my convention. So I, I told that my squares are unit, but sometimes to do dynamics, we need to rescale. So actually, it's a ma so if you wish, this is a matter of considering origamis as integer points in modular space or rational points. I mean, the total area of an origami with n squares is n, because I'm taking unit squares. So if I wish to, but of course I can multiply everything by a scalar. By by uh, scaling to get area one, but of course, I mean this, the squares are not the unit anymore. So this is why I think in French we say surface à petit carreau, so little squares. Because uh, I mean, uh, if you think with area one, then the squares get smaller. <laughs> yes. Uh, yes, and they are in the same SL two Z orbit, but uh, we are going to see that later. <laughs> I'm going to, to uh, yeah, we are going to get uh, to that point, I think. Maybe. <laughs> uh, maybe. Let's see. <clears throat> okay, so this gives a bound on, I mean, at least uh, how many squares you need to build a surface. That's good. Um, so let me see. Um, yeah, so still talking about this modular, uh, modular spaces. Um, yeah, so let me give a, a less uh, trivial example, maybe. And then let, let me try to apply uh, this matrix here to this polygon. So basically this matrix is fixed in this direction and then uh, every uh, unit step I take in the vertical, I'm replacing by a di diagonal step. So it should be something like that. 
Yeah, so this is once. Yeah, so it, no, it's hard to, to do that in, without tiling by squares, yeah. Uh, no, I'm taking that, that example out. I mean, uh, no, no, I'm not, do, I'm not going to do this example here, at least. Because I, I did this in the paper, but actually in the paper, I mean, my, my, my page is square tiled, so I can easily see uh, how to move. But uh, I think my picture will get nonsensical if I try to do that. So let me skip this point to some remarks about modular spaces. <clears throat> so modular spaces, they are uh, what people call uh, complex orbifolds. So they are not quite manifolds, but uh, almost manifolds or so complex orbifolds. So they are as good as manifolds for many purposes. And actually, uh, local coordinates, in some sense, Local coordinates can be obtained uh, from the vectors in R2, which is also known as the complex plane. Uh, the vectors representing representing sides of polygons <clears throat> okay so if you if you keep track of sides of polygons in this case of squares you can use these things to model what happens when you try to deform this picture so this is what people call period coordinates but just to mention that I mean this is complex and uh, actually has a, a nice structure nice local coordinates and uh, actually, in this sense, square tile surfaces, square tile surfaces are integer points. So it was shown by uh, Gutkin Judge, uh, proved that uh, you are an origami, if and only if. These vectors, these coordinates, vectors belong to Z2. So in this sense, they are integral points. Um, 2G uh, plus uh, sigma minus 1, which is also the answer for the uh, question Posted to Pascal, what is the number? I mean, which is almost the answer. Yeah, which is the answer for the question they posed to Pascal about the number of intervals in intervention transformations? Yeah, but uh, it's not it's not so easy to see. I mean, uh, I, because I thought that the coordinates can be obtained, but uh, I mean, it, you you don't keep track of all sides because there are relations in homology. So anyway, so this is the dimension of this guy. If you are curious. Um, square tile surface uh, are integer points, and actually, this leads to a very interesting um, development of theory, which is the following. Um, actually, you know, since Gauss, that you can try to compute volumes of balls by counting integral points. Right? Yes? What's an integer point? Uh, well, you, you can. You can take this as definition. I mean, uh, <laughs> I mean, in R two, integer points are in points with integral coordinates. Okay. So these are points with integral coordinates. Yeah. yeah, this is almost tautological if you take this as the coordinates. But uh, the coordinates yeah, exactly. The, the, the vectors. Yeah, that, that, that's what I wrote. The vectors belong to Z two. I mean, ve vectors. I mean, these vectors here, presenting sizes. Yeah, so uh, you know how to count. Uh, you know that volumes of balls are approximated by counting integers. Actually, uh, you can count, compute volume of modular spaces. So volume, so volume with respect to a measure, which is called the Mazur-Vich measure, which is the natural Lebesgue measure on this guy. Vich measure volume of modular spaces. Uh, counting by counting square surface. And actually, if you start counting square surfaces, 
um, via this method, then uh, you find many, many interesting keywords like multi zeta value. Uh, Quasi-modular forms. And uh, many, many other things. I mean, uh, you can build a generating series out of the numbers that you get by counting square tile surface. And uh, these things have many interesting properties. So uh, some names I should mention here are, of course, uh, Anton Zorich uh, and uh, Eskin Okunkov. And then uh, you can ask also uh, some other DF for the case of H2 and uh, many, many persons in this conference. I'm not going to name all of them. But uh, you, you have the opportunity during the conference to ask uh, many persons about this development. But I'm not going to say and <coughs> nothing more about that. It's just to uh, make you curious maybe about this and then motivate you to talk to people. Yeah, but there is a, there are, there is a lot of beautiful mathematics in this side. Um, and uh, another remark is that this is strat th this uh, complex orbifolds, they are not always um, connected. <coughs> so strata are not connected in general, but uh, connected components uh, or classified by conception Zorich in this case. And also, uh, you can ask, for instance, A1, if you want to see uh, about a little bit more general case of half translation surfaces. And uh, the uh, the punchline is that uh, uh, there are three connected components at most. <coughs> okay, so it's not far from being connected as a complex orbifold. So it's uh, almost connected, only three connected components. And we understand precisely when these components show up. Okay, <coughs> so now I'm going back to basic theory, yes? Uh, I mean, easy, easy, it, it's not, uh, it, it depends on uh, what you can, you want to assume. I mean, if you assume uh, that uh, a certain combinatorial gadget called the uh, uh, Hosey diagrams allow to classify connected components, then it's easy. I mean, it can, for small cases, for H4, H6, you can uh, differentiate with them using combinatorics. But uh, in general, it's not, uh, yeah. <coughs> OK. Um, yeah, so I'm going back to, the, to Earth after going to modular space. So back to Earth. I'm going to talk about the more uh, elementary properties of origamis. So I have, uh, what, 10 minutes, more or less? Or? I don't know when I started, so. <laughs> OK. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going back to Earth, so Pascal can uh, sleep again. <laughs> uh, no, I'm joking. I, 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 yeah, fine. I, mean, I, I know Pascal since ever, so I, I, I can't miss the opportunity. <laughs> uh, no, but uh, OK, so um, back to the basic theory of origamis. Uh, I'm going to distinguish between two types of origami, so reduced and primitive. Uh, the, the nomenclature is not completely standard in the literature. But the idea is that, so reduce it, definition. Um, uh, so an origami x omega, origami is reduced whenever uh, it's what people call period lattice. So this is means that it's the lattice spanned by the integrals along omega of paths connecting a path between conical C 
singularities. Uh, so it's uh, con uh, period lattice, so equal span of this thing. Uh, equals, so this is, the, so, well, this is the definition of period lattice. And the condition is that equals to z plus iz. <coughs> okay. So in other words, uh, I don't want to see the following picture. I don't want uh, the natural uh, cover that comes from the torus to factor. So I told you that origami comes with a, a projection, pi. And I don't want this projection to factor to some intermediate torus in a non-trivial way. Right? So not reduce it if p prime and p are non-trivial. <coughs> so this means, yeah, so I'm going to, this is the analytical point of view, say. So from people from Earth, uh, they would say that uh, we don't want to represent a surface uh, using uh, unnecessary squares. So for instance, <coughs> e equal, sorry. Oh. So example of non-reduced, you take the L. So we know that the similarities for the L are here, right? Um, and now, what you could do to define another square tile surface is simply decompose these squares into little squares. So of course, you know that I mean, this operation of taking a square tile surface and putting more squares than needed is a little bit redundant. I mean, it does not add anything to the geometry. I mean, I'm just putting <coughs> more squares. But I mean, what else? I mean, uh, this, is, this is good for nothing. So. Reduced means that we are using, really using essential squares when representing our surface. And uh, in this case, uh, how do I know that uh, the big, so this is not a reduced, though, so yellow, not a reduced. But yellow is reduced. Why? Because I have examples of um, elements of the period lattice. So one element is just integrating by this path. the form dz, I get the vector 1, 0, uh, or 1, if you wish, in complex numbers. And if I integrate this guy here, I get i. And so, and of course, 1 and i spend the usual lattice. So this guy is reduced. Uh, we see that uh, we are putting a big square. But the other one, I mean, it's a tiny square. So, And so we stand the assumption from now on in my, in my course. Um, um, origamis are always reduced. Okay, I'm not going to use unnecessary squares. So that uh, I mean, I if you don't put uh, reduced, many statements that I'm going to claim are not quite true. So, for instance, statements about the Vich group being SL to Z are not quite true. And so I want to avoid silly complications. So I'm reducing everything. And now what is primitive? So primitive is uh, a step further in that decomposition. So primitive means that we are not, we are, we are not a cover. <coughs> Always primitive. So. So let me define it's not primitive if there exists an intermediate origami so that we can factor pi as a cover like that. So the, differ the difference between reducing and primitive is that here we only had, we had tori. And now we have any, we have any origami. <coughs> yeah? uh, the of 
Mm -hmm. Is always the C, uh, R2 over C2 or can be another torus? Uh, yeah, so, so uh, actually, yeah, the, the point is that it's my uh, R2 over uh, Z2, and the difference between them is what people call uh, isogeny. It's just moving the, the lattice. Because in your example, if you've got that, the, the top uh, square, and you forget the two, <laughs> then you have a square third surface, which is not produced Is not C2, mm -hmm. but you don't factor to a square torus. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, but I think if you have uh, twice, then. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it's just changing. Uh, yeah, so, so P uh, here ser serves just to change the lattice. So it's, uh, yeah, so, so in, in your case, this is, uh, P is this map sending the, uh, this two by one torus to the one torus. Yeah, so it's, yeah. Yeah, so I think it's that way. Yeah, you're, you're right. I mean, uh, yeah, my picture is, uh, yeah, it's just a particular case, but uh, you could have more. Rectangular torus, I don't know how to call them. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> yeah, so the concrete definition, I mean, the, the formal definition is there, and uh, the, the way of decomposing can vary, yes, because you can, you can send the uh, Z2 Z inside itself in many ways. <coughs> OK, um, so this is primitive. And so example of something which is primitive, not reduced. Uh, so yeah, sorry, <laughs> I take back, that back. So remark is that uh, primitive implies reduced because uh, we can't allow all prime to be T2. But uh, this thing here, Uh, it's reduced, but not primitive. Uh, because, of course, you see there is a map to the usual L. Right? It's two copies of the same L side by side. So you see that you can map. It's a two, two to one cover. <coughs> OK. So this is reduced, not reduced. Um, OK, so let's uh, talk about primitivity from the combinatorial point of view. And uh, I'm taking my last five minutes to do that. Uh, and next time, I'm, we are going to do dynamics. We are going to talk about the action of SL2R and SL2Z. So let me just mention uh, more elementary theory. So because I think it's beautiful. And uh, oh, I, should, I should mention this thing because it's really cute. So combinatorially, um, you can, given an origami, so uh, as a pair of permutations H and V, uh, you can look, you can associate the uh, a permutation group, so the subgroup generated by this guy. I'm calling it sigma O. So it's the permutation group associated to this origami. Uh, some persons call them monodromy, but I'm going to reserve the word monodromy for other business later. Actually, monodromy for me would be more like the conservatological cycle. So I don't want to call this the monodromy group, but this is a, this. So I'm going to give an artificial name, so associated permutation group. And it can be checked, so I'm going to prove this proposition here. But it can be checked that, um, so O uh, is primitive if and only if sigma O is primitive. 
So primitive in the sense of group theory. So this means that there are no blocks. So a block is the following. Um, so let me see. You look, you denote by SQ. So I'm defining this, this concept. <coughs> so SQ is the set of squares. In this case, uh, there are just one, two, n. Um, and then uh, primitive means that uh, uh, there exists no subset of the squares of size of non-trivial size, so not you single point, not uh, all squares. Uh, there exists no delta, so that alpha delta is either equal or disjoint from itself for all elements of the permutation group. <laughs> right? So this is what people call a block. So this is more or less what you were uh, mentioning. When so a block is a, a piece which moves uh, well under the <coughs> under the group. And the idea is that if, had, if you had such a block, then you can use this block to define a cover and contradict primitivity. And uh, actually, this is uh, why I like this name, primitive, because it comes from group theory. What is the <coughs> uh, SQ is the set of squares of the origami. <coughs> so squares is uh, in this case is the set one to n, right? Because when I give an origami by a pair of permutations, I'm labeling these squares. Yeah, this group acts on the set of squares. I mean, right? Oh, it's a group together. Yeah, so, so this group is a permutation group on the. On the set of n elements. Yeah, on the set of n elements, which are these squares. Okay. Yeah, so, so you should think of H and V as moving these squares around. Yeah. And I don't want to have a block. Yes? Yeah, this, uh, this is purely a group theory, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, thank you. So uh, just to conclude, I, I'm really conclude on that. I want to state a beautiful theorem of, uh, uh, well, in this form it was remarked by David Zmiako, really. But uh, so where is my piece of, it's there. So I, I'm, I'm going to invoke uh, the great, uh, so the theorem that I want to conclude this lecture, of course I'm not going to prove it. Uh, so you take O, so this theorem is the analog of the proposition that I had about the number of squares. But I'm, I'm, I'm going to, so I have an origami, which is primitive. <coughs> uh, with uh, four times sigma uh, kn plus m square. So it's twice the number of minimal squares square. <coughs> uh, then this group here is either the alternating group or the symmetric group. And the proof of this result is a long tradition, so I'm going just to say in a few words, so proof, is the fact that, uh, which goes back to Jordan, and uh, more recently to Babai and Pieber, which asserts that uh, a group, a primitive group with, uh, in this number of letters, uh, it's either the alternating group or the symmetric group. So Jordan proved that a, a group uh, which is primitive and contains a two cycle should be the symmetric group. If it contains a three cycle, it contains the alternating group, and then there is a whole uh, theory about uh, primitive groups of permutation groups. And uh, basically, this, this is just a theorem which follows from translating what people in, in combinatorial group theory did into this setting thanks to this arrow. Uh, so, uh, with uh, this number of squares. Yeah, so tied by at least this number. 
right? And so this means that actually this group takes only two values, <laughs> typically. I mean, for, for all but finitely many square tile surfaces, this permutation group takes only two values, alternating and symmetric. And I'm going to use that uh, to continue the discussion about that. Uh, because this, is a, this, as you are going to see later, is a nice invariant of the origami when you are trying to classify your orbits and things like that. But I think I have no time. I'm sorry. I'm seeing five minutes. Thank you.